Um, and do we go straight into it? Yeah. No, I, I, I'm in control, that's wonderful. So um, firstly, thank you all for being here. My name's Keith Tier, as you can see in my little thing there. Um, I am a British born, um, four decades long tech entrepreneur. Um, if you go back far enough, I worked in databases and networks in the 1980s. Uh, in the 1990s, I founded EasyNet, which was the first consumer facing internet provider in Europe. And uh, moved to the US in 1997 and did a company called Real Names, which enabled character sets which are not based on Latin characters to be used in web addresses. So people in China and Korea and Arabic world and uh, Hebrew, Cyrillic could basically have keyword like web addresses that would go to a URL and they could type it in their own language. That was real names. And then a little later, I was part of TechCrunch where I was the first investor and partner to Mike Larrington, the founder. And now uh, for the last three years, I've been running a venture fund in the UK called Accelerated Digital Ventures that invests in seed stage startups in digital technology. So I kind of entrepreneur became investor. I will uh, admit to you that um, I'm really much more of an entrepreneur than an investor. Um, I really hate the idea of being an investor. So um, during the last um, period at home, my entrepreneur brain um, refused to go away. And I started thinking about what it is I would want to do for the next 10 years. Um, which, which uh, you know, is pro probably a question I've asked myself many times in my life. And I started to think about um, the problem of distributing cash to, to citizens that arose during the coronavirus. Um, even a sophisticated organization like the US government had massive problems distributing $1,200 to individuals. And they had to jump through all kinds of hoops. And I think even now many individuals never received it. And this is in an age where everyone has a digital social security number, everyone has bank accounts, everyone has, uh, pretty much everyone has some kind of a phone. Most people in the US have a smartphone. Uh, the concept of a digital wallet is well known. Pretty much everything is there that would make it trivial to do this, but, but, it, but it's still very hard. Added to that, we have the accelerated experience of what a workless society looks like, uh, a society without work. And um, at least for me, that's the likely end game of human civilization. A society without work is not a society of unemployed, but is a society of choice when um, the necessities of life are delivered through automated solutions and human beings have free time and can choose what to do. Like, I love photography, I love videography, I like gardening, you know, um, all of which are productive, but pretty much uh, joys for me. Uh, I would have more time to do those things in an automated workless future. Obviously what we're in now is a, uh, enforced workless present. That all got me thinking and um, I came up with, and I'm going to share a screen now just so you're not all surprised when the screen changes. Um, I came up with uh, a solution and created a website called uh, UBI Network. And UBI Network is all about um, trying to figure out how to use existing technology to make it possible to address every citizen of every country and deposit into a, uh, a place where they can spend it um, sufficient means to, uh, to sustain their life, whether they're working or not. And, and there's a long history of universal 
income or universal basic income conversation. And I don't want to re rehash that because I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, what I did is try to figure out a practical way to deliver it within 12 months to everyone on earth without asking governments to agree. Um, and, and, and almost all initiatives in this space have fallen foul of the need for approval um, and, uh, uh, and regulatory and policy issues. So what I came up with is, is um, borrowing from existing human practice, something everyone is familiar with and making it universal. And that, and that is the practice of giving a coupon in return for a discount. So if you, if, if those of you who live in the United States, but I'm sure it's the same everywhere, there are, uh, there are all kinds of points schemes where when you do something, you earn rewards or points. Airline miles are a great example of that. And there are all kinds of coupon schemes where you know a major chain of supermarkets will print a coupon in a newspaper you'll clip it out and when you go and buy your breakfast cereal you'll get 10 percent discount because you brought the coupon um, and there's also a third thing which is cashback schemes where if you spend a hundred dollars you get ten dollars cash back or three percent cash back or whatever whatever these are all known things so what i've done is started to build a team and design a system to take the concept of cashback or a discount of points and to be able to issue discount tokens to everyone in the world to a, to, to, to a amount to be determined. And then secondly, to get merchants who are selling products or services to agree to take those tokens in exchange for a discount or a cashback thus uh, allowing an individual to extend their spending power by some percent. Initially, my guess is 10 to 20% would be reasonable. Most merchants will give a 10 to 20% discount to a customer that they want. But I think over time, as these tokens are received, um, they, are, they become valuable. Why? Because they represent a basket of goods that were exchanged for them or a service that was exchanged for them that has a, 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 a tangible value. And so the tokens will take on the value of what they can buy and will become fungible. That is to say, you can spend them with, with each other and the merchants that take them can spend them with their supply chain. And so from a token that is earning a discount, uh, like a point scheme, it will morph into effectively a currency over time and therefore we'll be able to purchase a much larger percent of a basket of goods and services that's basically the idea on the website I'm, i won't play it now although i was tempted so i could be lazy there's a 20-minute interview here with a, with me with a, a very um uh persistent interviewer called Andrew Keane, who's a, uh, an author who's published a few books, who's a, a strong, you know, uh, his stance is that he doesn't believe it's possible and I have to prove that it is. And I encourage you all to have a look at that interview because it, it kind of covers everything. With that said, and bearing in mind that this is meant to be conversational, I think what I'll do is stop talking and then I'll let us move to a more conversational mode. Uh, uh, Tia, I don't know if you want to act as the kind of moderator here. Yeah, sure. I, I love talking. Um, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we had a brief little conversation about UBI earlier and there, you know, I think one of the main arguments against it, uh, aside from inflation, is how do you keep incentive for the individual high? Like how do you keep purpose high in, in a space where we're, where we're giving stuff away? And um, that would be my like the only thing that's that's kind of difficult to to reach into there is how do you make sure people are incentivized to do better with themselves? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer that, but if anybody else wants feels like they want to say something, I'll pause for a minute so that I'm not dominating. If somebody else wants to, please unmute and go ahead. 
Um, uh, Keith, Salim here. Hey, Salim. How are you? I am very well. This is an old friend of mine I haven't seen for probably two or three years. It's been a while. Uh, quick question. When you, are you talking about UBI in its, in its kind of uh, 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 current sense in terms of the Andrew Yang type of model, or do you mean a token-based structure? I am not talking the Andrew Yang model. In fact, I think it's, my starting point is governments will never do this, not in any reasonable frame of time. Uh, so then you come back to, should you build a not-for-profit blockchain-based token mechanism, or should you build an impact-based for-profit version of that? I probably come down on the for-profit side because I think it puts incentives in place for everyone to play. Um, but it's definitely, it's a global commercial initiative, either for profit or not for profit, to deliver tokens into people's, let's call it wallets in general, but that's going to be one word that covers a lot of different mechanisms for distributing. Um, and they get to spend it with merchants who want them as a customer. Got it. Okay. So it's very like Libra, except you don't have to exchange dollars to get it. It's going to be given to you. Um, so if you looked at the Facebook Le Libra project, yeah. the difference to Libra is Libra is a currency, or was in its first incarnation. Uh, the government's freaked out and more or less blocked it. And Facebook's now transformed it into a simple token-based payment mechanism backed by dollars or pounds or whatever your local currency is. And it's kind of like just PayPal with tokens. But uh, so the lesson from Libra is please don't launch a currency and try to get governments to agree with you they won't. Hence, moving to the points-based discount or cashback schemes, which are, you know, when you take a Safeway coupon in, it is not considered income to you, but it is worth money. Um, well, I guess what well, we have got Libra on the on the table there. I was when I saw that they had brought Kiva on board, uh, the the microfinancing platform. I was when I got excited for for the Facebook platform because uh, for for Libra because I think getting you just a lower remittance fees was such a, a huge deal for companies like Kiva. Um, I, I would be it would be interesting to see how that conversation moves forward now, especially as the Chinese government is deciding that they're going to basically <laughs> create their own Libra um, when Facebook was a, mu a much better way to bring in all of the other G G7 countries, essentially. Um, well, governmental digital currencies are probably going to become ubiquitous. Uh, I, I recently did a consulting gig with um, the company that prints the banknotes and the coins for Germany. Um, and the, they wanted me to talk about the future of money. And it, it seems clear that the, the money will be, money already is largely digital. I mean, it, it's basically fake. When you go to the bank and ask for a thousand dollar loan, what they do is they give you my thousand dollars. And they also give my thousand dollars to three other people. And they basically fake that they have three times or five times or 10 times more money than they really have. And it's all digital. It goes in, into a, a, an account, you owe it back to them. And when you pay them back, you pay interest and they make money on, you know, lending my money five times or 10 times or whatever. So the existing system is already digital and it's heavily based on money power brokers leveraging the collective money pool on their own behalf. That, that um, you know, apart from being disgusting, it's, it's um, highly dysfunctional and generally leads to regular cyclical crises, uh, inflation or deflation, depending on the, on the circumstances. So back to your original question, is this inflationary? Uh, the answer is it would be if it was just printing money. But if it's replacing money with a new instrument of purchase that can acquire goods from merchants, it is um, stable. 
it, it, because its value is, un, is underpinned by the basket of things it can buy. And what happens is normal money, which is inflationary or deflationary, usually inflationary, um, will, you know, over time, I think we all probably would recognize that we're living in a period where the money system, which is the US dollar as, a bat, as, a, as part of a basket of currencies that the world uses, um, it, its strength and ability to do that is only as strong as the US economy, which is only as strong as the US's relative strength in the world, which clearly is declining relatively vis-a-vis -vis China especially. And so the American dollar is gonna go through the same set of challenges that the British pound went through between the two world wars. And, and the, the world at that time moved from the pound to the gold standard for a while until the Bretton Woods conference happened. So the question is, what do we citizens of the world do to protect ourselves from what I consider to be uh, highly volatile and unstable money in order to be able to sustain life, whilst at the same time dealing with the fact going back to your question about motivation, most people are not going to have a job. But that isn't, that isn't a choice, that's a likelihood. And if most people are not gonna have a job, I don't believe for a minute they're all gonna become fat couch potatoes who don't do anything. Because human beings make effort all the time for each other. Like my mother made effort for me and my siblings and never got paid a cent. Um, why, what was she motivated by? She was motivated by raising her kids. So I, I, I don't believe there's any lack of motivation to make effort and that you're only motivated if you get money. I think that's probably enough. I can talk for a long time, so I should show up. Um, so, so guys, uh, another question I want to throw up there is, if everyone is going to receive their, their you know, the, that minimum basic income, and we're talking about incentives, what kind of incentives could we do or could we give from, to creators or just people who are consuming, you know, but that they are not monetary, you know, instead of giving a little bit more for people that create, a, it would be a, like a special access to the system of what kind of special incentives besides monetary would we throw to the to the system to be more creative well the the technical answer is you've got to allow person to person actions and not include transferring assets to each other unless you have a mechanism for you know, if I agree to come and photograph your wedding because you're a friend, I'll do it for free. But if you want to uh, reward me at the end, there has to be a way that you can. Now, reward number one is to say thank you and smile at me and give me a big hug. That, that actually is quite a big reward. Um, but if you want to give me some tangible reward, there's, there's ways to do that. I was saying earlier, there's a great novel called for us, the living, which is a science fiction novel. And it actually answers this conundrum. Um, it, 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 the, the novel is about a man who dies in a car crash in 1939. And the, and the novel was written in 1939. And he wakes up alive in 2083. And a, a woman rescues him from the side of a mountain and takes him to her home. And she explains to him that in 2083, everyone in the world gets a heritage check, which is a check that is your right for being a human. And this heritage check is, is it's not a gift or a charity, it's a right. And um, nobody has to work, literally nobody has to work, but she chooses to, and she does a dance once a week. And he describes a flat screen on the wall where she dances in her room and the world can see her perform. And as she's dancing at the end, her heritage wallet has more in it than when she started. Um, now that is, there is still consumption in this science fiction because everyone wants to eat and so on. Um, 
And, you know, some people, you know, don't want to wear jeans and t-shirts, but want to wear something that, that uh, takes more effort by another, another human being. So there's still the concept of value in the Adam Smith and Ricardo sense. There's still exchange, there's still effort, but it isn't paid employment. And there's peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Get it. Mm -hmm. Someone else want to say what kind of incentives there could be? Maybe well, some it's not it's not directly related but i've tossed around the idea in my mind of um i think i think marketing in general is going to go this direction have you guys ever seen bill plute on twitter does twitter philanthropy i haven't he, he, he made a bunch of money and he gives away anywhere between a hundred to ten thousand dollars a day to to random people on his on his twitter account um he was inspired by Mr. Beast, which is a, a big YouTuber who was doing stunt philanthropy as well. Like he'd go up to some, uh, he'd give like a $10,000 tip to a waitress and uh, some random stuff like this. I, I think more and more we're going to see brands incentives to use their marketing budget to give money directly to their consumer. Instead of say spend $500,000 on a, a marketing campaign, just give that money directly to your consumers. And, and let them go, go down that path. I think we're going to actually see brands um, and, and industry start to take over part of this UBI uh, idea and just start to give people their marketing budgets instead. So my question is, do you think that there would be enough value generated by uh, these businesses and merchants to equate to, let's say, UBI of like 1,000 a month, which would be like a few trillion? Um, the whole population of the US. So I didn't, sorry, my dog barked in the middle of your question, and so I, it blocked it out. Just, just give me the question again. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I was wondering if you think there would be enough value generated by this coupon system where businesses and merchants are um, putting that same value of coupons into this, uh, this system. And if that would equate to the same amount of the traditional UBI of like 1,000 a month, which is a few trillion. You know, if you think about it, world GDP is 85 trillion and the consumer goods part of that is about 30 trillion. My numbers could be wrong because it's a while since I looked at I think that's broadly right. If you assume that most merchants would give it a 10% discount in order to acquire a customer. That's about three trillion a year in discounts alone. And, and so um, three trillion, you know, you divide, you divide uh, seven billion people into three trillion and um, you get to a discount based average amount that you could give to everyone. Uh, actually, that amount probably isn't enough, but it's a pretty good starting point. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people that believes, and I should tell you just on a personal note, I, I was raised in a very poor Northern English family. My dad was an alcoholic. My mother, therefore, was pretty much a single mom and she had six kids. And we qualified for things like free school meals and we qualified for a free school uniform. My mother always refused to take the free stuff because she was embarrassed by it because it turns out poor people actually don't like charity. It, it feels demeaning in a way. So the reason I like this heritage check is it's a right of being a human being. And for that reason, my starting point isn't charity, but it's um, human sustenance. Um, in a context of a declining work. Um, and, and, and I think that therefore it's a structural societal requirement and it probably has to be global, a little bit like ICANN is global and governments are stakeholders but don't run ICANN. I think it probably has to be global and it probably has to be controlled through software with rules that are, are changeable through governance globally. Um, and uh, it probably needs to be enough for you to not have to work, um, but without 
uh, removing the choice to want to. And now that, then it gets really complicated and I haven't got answers to lots of complicated questions like, should everyone in the world get the same amount even though GDP per capita is so different between countries? You know, if the answer is no, then Americans get more than people in Guatemala. It seems fair, right? Uh, it seems like somebody's dis, dis, that leveling up becomes impossible. Um, so my starting point is everyone gets the same um, and it's got to be enough. Well, what is that? I don't know. Is, is it $2,000 a month? Is it, it's definitely not $1,000 a month because that wouldn't work in a lot of places. Surely, surely you could do levels over regions. You could, but I think, I think that might not be fair. I mean, well, it would be more, it would someone, be more. If someone in Indonesia, $2,000 a month, they wouldn't be able to spend it because there wouldn't be enough merchants offering that much discount. They probably no, wouldn't. You don't, you don't do it that way. You, you have something like the, well, uh, yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's something like um, uh, a universal amount across the world. And then you have a nation state amount. And then you have a regional amount. Interesting. Based on, and um, if you, if for instance, you could get the equivalent spending power of one US dollar per day to everybody in the world, you would instantly get the UN sustainability goal of no poverty by 2030. So if you could get that money to them, which is only about 5 trillion a year, which is out of a hundred and something or other trillion GDP a, a year is actually quite small. Um, it could, it could very well be done. Um, and then nation states could use the same technology, but a different, uh, mechanism in terms of a currency. So it could be a fiat currency, um, that, gave a UBI for that nation. So Indonesia might, everybody might be getting one US dollar uh, globally from some central body, su su somewhat like the IMF, instead of the IMF providing money to governments for governments to, to distribute, the IMF provides currency to the people directly the nation states then provide a top up by um, using the same wallets, but a different currency that is the spending power in their, um, in their nation. So that might be the equivalent of, in Indonesia, it might be the equivalent of five US dollars per day. And then on a regional basis, Jakarta might be a much more expensive region to live in and the regional economy of Jakarta might be topping up with in the same wallet but a different currency a currency that is spent only in Jakarta of maybe another couple of dollars per day by having tiers that are and because it's a digital currency and you can do things like tag transactions, you could put demurrage on it so that where you want velocity of spending, you can say, okay, well, this Jakarta currency, we want this to spin around really fast. If you don't spend it within 30 days, it loses 5% of its value. And so it gives a priority on, on the UBI that's been delivered. And I believe that what you're saying about heritage check, you can justify that 
in the systems we have at the moment called patents and royalties that fall out of you know, the knowledge that Newton produced back in the back when Newton was alive is still producing wealth now. It's just fallen back into the commons. Uh, Greg, Greg, we've reached our time limit. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, the next session is about to come on. If, can I suggest if you want to continue the conversation, there is a form on ubinetwork.org. Anyone who wants to continue the conversation, participate, feel free to fill the form in and you'll get put onto um, a method where we can interact. Okay, thank you. And thank you all so much. I just noticed there's questions in the chat that I didn't address. I apologize for that. I only just noticed them. Um, yes. Sorry, I should have posted them up there too. I apologize. Yeah. Great work, Keith. Thank you.